Good morning and welcome to the Monday Call brought to you by NZ Funds. I'm Stefan Clark, Chief Client Officer at NZ Funds and I'm joined today by Mark Brooks, Senior Principal and Head of Income. After easing from a peak of 7.3% last year to 5.6% at the last print, we are slowly winning the war on inflation. Investors, households, employers and many others are focused on the path from here. This week, we're joined by KiwiBank's Chief Economist, Jared Kerr, to discuss current economic data, including the recent inflation print. We will be asking when the Reserve Bank can start reducing the OCR, how resilient is the New Zealand economy, is unemployment increasing, will the recent election have any impact, and what might a turn in the, mar in the cycle mean for asset values, such as property and the New Zealand share market. Jared, fantastic to have you here. So um, it's been a while. I was actually looking back, uh, it was sort of 15 months or so ago that you last joined us and a heck of a lot has happened in the meantime, including losing the World Cup. Um, let's kick off with inflation um, at a high level. Are you a believer that it can be put back in the box? Oh, definitely. Absolutely. Uh, it just, it just, a matter of, of how long and, and, and how much pain do we have to go through uh, to get there. I, I think we were kind of hoping that inflation would be a little lower uh, now. You know, when we last spoke, you know, 15 months ago, inflation's definitely surprised us on the high side. And I think going into next year, there's still some frustrations uh, there. You know, oil prices have spiked recently with the, with the war in the Middle East. And uh, there's a lot of uh, you know, price pressures still bubbling away. Um, but I think, you know, central banks globally are, are going to win the war. They, they have to, um, and they're going to do whatever it takes to, to get inflation back down, you know, towards 3%. Um, and I think the move from 7.3, as you mentioned, down to 5.6, it's been relatively easy. Uh, a lot of that is uh, global inflation having come having come off quite a lot uh, over the last year that next move uh, to sort of four percent i think is almost baked in the cake uh, what we're interested in is is you know can we get that four percent number back down to two and i think that's going to be the more difficult um, move with with what we're seeing in the underlying data so they'll definitely get us there um, there's no question on that it's just how long and, and how hard uh, it, it takes us to get there. Right. Why, why is it so, I mean, at, at a, going back to first principles for a moment, why is it so important that we get it down to 2 and 3%? What is, what is the, 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 I guess, the economic driver for that? And why are central banks so focused on putting it back in the box? Yeah, so uh, New Zealand was the first uh, central bank um, globally to, to properly target uh, inflation, you know, coming out of the 70s and, and 80s where, you know, inflation was a, was a, a big problem. Uh, we focused on it and said, you know, we want price stability uh, and then over, over time price stability by most central banks around the world is kind of a, a 2% uh, run rate in inflation. You know, it's, it's, it's relatively stable. It's not causing uh, any any harm at, at sort of two percent, you know, inflation at seven point three percent that we've just seen, you know, causes a a, a lot of harm, uh, particularly for for savers. So um, the idea is that you know you can you can suppress uh, inflation pressure, keep it you know nice and steady, and that enables businesses to make you know better decisions, not having to worry about inflation running at very high or, or even very low uh, levels. Um, sort of remind listeners that over the last 15 years, we've kind of had inflation running at the, the low point, uh, and we've only just over the last couple of years seen inflation spike uh, to levels not seen since the 1980s. Yeah, and um, at the same time, there's a lot of government spending, a lot of demand for infrastructure. And so that's a, you know, naturally an expansionary um, a driver, how do you feel with the new government probably coming in soon that um, that's going to change the inflation outlook and and the you know when spending is so high? Yeah, so the government does add uh, to demand in the economy when they spend more. 
uh, as you as you pointed pointed out, and uh, that can become problematic depending on the the type of of spending. Um, but even infrastructure spending, which is what we desperately need because we've underinvested for for a long long time, even that adds demand uh, to the economy and can add to inflation pressure. Uh, and there's a few things that are that are going on that you know around the the cyclone we had earlier in the year and and you know trying to rebuild from that. It, it is adding uh, to the economy. It is adding to uh, in inflation pressure. Um, but we've kind of put ourselves in a in a bad space where we we have underinvested in, in infrastructure for a very long time. Uh, and if we don't do it now, then you know we're just kicking the can down the road again and again and again. And you know there's a lot of productivity gains I think to be to be made from you know investing in infrastructure, getting our infrastructure where it should be, but then also thinking about where New Zealand needs to be uh, with solid population growth forecast. You know, uh, forever we we need to we need to spend more on the infrastructure. That's the good spending. I don't mind a bit of inflation coming out of there, but too much government spending, you know, across across the board. I think that needs to be addressed. And I do think the new government will be coming in with a with a, a fresh uh, set of eyes. And you know, they they've explicitly said that they're going to try and cut back on on some of the uh, you know less important uh spending and and trying to allocate a bit more funds to the to the infrastructure which is what we need does that think does that sort of suggest that uh you know it sort of a slightly higher level of government spending along with some of the other structural forces out there like sort of deglobalization bringing inventories closer to home at the <clears throat> at the minimum and then the sort of decarbonization spend that's going on that we're probably in a world where yeah, inflation is likely to bubble away more than we've seen over the last sort of decade or two. Yeah, I think you've raised a couple of really good points there. Um, you know, if we are in a deglobalization world, I'm not convinced we are, but you know, the, the percentage of of trade that we're doing is definitely plateauing and, and looking like it's coming off. Um, and you know, that onshoring that that uh, you know, trying to come up with a with a stronger, a bit more diversified um supply chain and you know potentially doing more onshore uh you know that is inflationary uh china uh you know is is not as deflationary as it as it once was um even, even but, though their yeah you know, sort of ppi inflation is actually negative at present and yeah so the ppi is negative their their cpi is at zero um but we're not getting the the disinflation from china that we did over that particularly the 90s period, I guess is what I'm thinking of, you know, when China really opened up and, and started to become the global manufacturer um, based on a lower, uh, lower cost base. Uh, we're, not, we're not getting that again, um, to your point about onshoring and, do, and doing other things. It, it, it is inflationary. Uh, it does look like, you know, we'll get inflation rates higher over the next decade than what we did over the last uh 10 10 to 15 years and um you know central banks will have that uh in mind so <clears throat> without wanting to get too technical does that suggest we've sort of got a higher neutral inflation uh oh, sorry higher neutral interest rate going forward than what we've had over the, again over the last 10 or 20. yeah potentially um you know there's there's an aging demographic uh in there which which has sort of kept things low and i think that slowly reverses as well um so yeah it looks like you know the reserve bank uh had the the neutral rate at about two and they're saying it's now sort of two to three um which i i think is about right um so you know interest rates uh at that sort of two to three level are no longer uh, restrictive or or stimulatory um, and that goes, you know, to to your point there about uh, all all those bits and pieces bubbling away in the background. The the other thing I'd probably raise is that we're going through, you know, we're starting to go through a, a massive, I think, boost uh, in technology with the introduction of AI. So that could be quite deflationary, um, but we'll have to we'll have to wait and see. So there are forces going both ways. Amongst economists, um, particularly in New Zealand, but in other countries too, there's been 
quite a lot of discussion and different perspectives on the impact of migration on inflation. And even among the bank economists and others in New Zealand, it um, seems to be quite a hot debate. What's your take on how much um, migration affects the inflationary, I guess, outlook and also economic activity more broadly? So um, I guess I better answer like an economist uh, would. You know, on the, on the one side, you've got supply and on the other side, you've got uh, demand and it's about, you know, which, which one... Uh, wins um, and I, I think we do have differing opinions around it. Um, history is a good guide. Uh, we had the, the, the largest migration boom in New Zealand's history from 2013 to 19. That really did put downward pressure on wages and how do we prove that? Well why don't we close the borders and see what happens to wages after you know you stop migration. So obviously we had COVID for a period uh, and the labour market tightened tightened up. Uh, we had to try and attract Kiwis into the workforce. We had to try and get Kiwis to do jobs uh, that were otherwise taken by uh, migrants. And you know we have seen you know wages tick up again. So we're looking at this you know from the supply side. We've we've basically imported 150,000 migrants over the last year, which is a record for us in one, in one year. We lost 40,000 uh, Kiwis offshore, but we've had this you know, massive net gain of 110. Uh, that is a big increase in the supply of workers in the, in the labor force. And um, you know, we're, we're seeing already uh, businesses telling us that the difficulty in finding uh, workers you know, is, is not as hard as what it was this time last year. So the conversations I've been having with our clients, uh, a lot of lot of uh, SME businesses, you know, this time last year was all about, you know, I just I just can't find the workers, you know, that I need. I, I just, you know, we're paying up, we're we're increasing wages, we just can't attract the workers. Now you ask them what's going on, and they're more worried about the future, the, their future earnings, uh, and other bits and pieces. They're no longer complaining about. Uh, the ability to find workers, and that's a that's a massive shift, and that's an increase in that uh, in supply. But of course, people come here, uh, and you know they need to settle, they need to buy a car, they need to either rent uh, a property or, or buy a house, uh, they need to do you know X Y Z, you know education for their kids, everything that they, they increase the demand for everything. Um, we think that disinflationary force on wages is going to be a bit stronger than the extra uh, inflation we'll get uh, from them spending money. And the reason we're coming to that conclusion is because we do import younger uh, people that, you know, they're generally aged 20 to, to, to sort of 35, but a lot of them are in, that, in, in their 20s uh, and they don't uh, spend uh, as much. So uh, we're, we're kind of thinking that that supply side will 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 beat the demand side on the on the migration and and will be you know a bit of a disinflationary force but it's it's tough we we'll kind of have to wait and see uh, as well so is that migration a, a key factor you think or are, are there other reasons as to why after sort of you know five percent of ocr increases that the economy still seems stressed but it's probably fairly i wouldn't say happy happy is too strong a word but it's uh it's coping. Yeah, I guess coping is a good way to say it. I, I've been telling people that we're in quite an awkward period, which, which, because you've got all these forces that are both hurting you, but also, um, you know, we're not seeing, you know, mass redundancies or, or you know, significant stress uh, in our financial markets at all. Um, the economy definitely has responded to higher interest rates. Uh, we started seeing it late last year and our spending data so on the kiwi bank credit cards we we noticed that people were spending a lot more on essentials and getting less in volume terms so having to spend more to get less and then while that was going on they pulled back spending on big ticket items and we've seen you know household furnishings for example declining uh you know in the spending so that i think tells you that that yes that big 
uh, increase in interest rates has definitely had an impact, and clearly it's had an impact on our on our housing market as well, with house prices down. So there has been a, a, a material slowing uh, in the Kiwi economy. We had a contraction at the end of last year. I think we're going to get a contraction now uh, in economic um, activity. So you know, a, a pretty meaningful um, impact, but one that we hope doesn't lead to a, a quite a sharp increase in unemployment. We think unemployment is going to increase from about 3.6 to about 5.5. Uh, next year. So, you know, it's definitely been felt. Firms are telling us that they're actually looking to downsize rather than expand, which is what they're telling us last year. Construction was such a huge part of the economy well, for a very long time. And the lag between when you start a project and when you commence and complete the project is so significant. So I guess, and I'm, I'm sort of Taking one step further from what you were saying is I, I suspect that we just haven't seen it yet, but that's coming. As rates stay higher for longer, people will have to, businesses yep. will start taking their foot off. Yep, definitely. It's already happening and, and we can see it. So um, in the housing market, uh, we've seen consents, you know, come off, um, not declining, sorry, but the, you know, the, the number of consents. Uh, com coming down. So that's a pretty clear sign that the housing market turned. Um, talking to developers, you know, last year, they were already, you know, reining back. They were finishing what they had, but they were, you know, questioning the need to do that next project. You know, we're not quite sure. We're not quite sure. Let's, let's rein things back. Um, from a bank's perspective, you know, the beginning of, of last year, that sort of 2022, we were, we were, you know, coming coming up with uh, lots of deals and lots of activity. Um, those deals haven't uh, come through, so they're all approved, um, but quite a few deals just haven't gone through. And I, and I put that down to the fact that you know interest rates have gone from uh, two and a half, three percent to seven, eight percent, and a lot of projects just don't make sense. So we've seen that on the housing side. We're also seeing it in in the broader economy. Uh, as well, you know, those decisions to expand, those decisions to build that extra factory or, or, or whatever, uh, a lot of them have been, uh, you know, put on the put on the sideline. This is a bit of a tangent, but does that suggest we might see some competition in, say, the mortgage space with banks? Because banks ultimately want to grow their book over time, and especially in an, an environment when there is a bit of inflation, there is that need to grow the lending book and sort of says that, you know, you know, I don't think Kiwi banks alone, lending books are not growing and are pretty stagnant. So, yeah, when we get closer to possibly people believing that interest rate peak is here, do you think we'll see sort of more mortgage competition out there? I think so. I mean, just thinking of it from the, the um, you know, us providing credit to the market as a, as a whole, um, you know, it depends what the demands like right do people want mortgages do people want these loans and the demand for for those loans as you say is, is uh has called quite a lot from from last year so you know we can we can heat up competition but if people don't want um the loans then it then it's quite difficult right uh, on the supply side on our willingness to lend uh, you know i i think banks as a whole have become a lot more conservative um you know with house prices falling the, the way they have with the the rapid rise in, in interest rates having quite a clear uh, impact on our on our customer base um, you know we can we can want to supply stuff but you know it really is that that demand side and I, I think there are a few things that are changing uh, if we get that interest deductibility put back on if we get Maybe a, a, a watering down of the of the triple CFA, um, you know, if bright line, if 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 um, the key bit is as you mentioned, if interest rates look like they're going to head south, then I think that demand will, will pick up next year. You, you mentioned earlier that um, uh, uh, durables, particularly, were um, not being bought as much as previously, and. Um, and also, that obviously, you, you've sort of forecast 5.5 as the inflation, uh, unemployment rate. Where, where in the economy do you think 
more you know we're going to see the unemployment coming through yeah good good question i think it's more the interest rate sensitive uh parts of the economy that you know i think it is yeah you know, going to be housing related stuff um it's going to be you know broad based uh we'll see some some uh potential downsizing in in agri and and, and other areas as well with the difficulty there and the and prices coming off. So I think it'll be broad based, but you know, those interest interest sensitive parts, uh, I think we're seeing already, you know, around the around the fringes of the of the housing market, you know, that discussion on construction, uh, you know, construction really had ramped up, but we're 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 forecasting that to to come off. So, you know, anything to do with the with the housing market, you know, construction as well. Uh, in in pockets, although there's demand coming through in other areas, you know, around the cyclone, for example. Um, but then I think more broad based as well. We'll we'll see a, a slowing into next year, um, and we've got a, a bit of a keen eye on on what's happening uh, in in agri space, right? If if our you know farmers actually start to to pull back even more, um, that has a an immediate ripple th- uh, effect through the through the economy. Yeah. Okay. You, you mentioned also a little bit before just about productivity and um, with a new government coming in, uh, are there any areas that you think this is the, the right time for us to be um, tackling our productivity problem? I think it's fair to say that New Zealand has not done a good job over the long run of improving our productivity levels. So it's a discussion uh, that's been pretty absent for a has. long time now. And, uh, the, I mean, I remember the productivity commission, I think it was in 2008, um, and you know there, it hasn't really been on the table that much since then. Um, so, are, are there particular areas that you're hoping that the government will, um, with a change in mindset, will look at? And are there particular areas uh, of opportunity which were low hanging fruit that we should be going for? Um, yeah, it's a good it's a good discussion. Um, our productivity hasn't looked uh, very good at all, but you know it's been a bit of a global uh, issue, right? Um, we don't actually look that bad compared to compared to other countries, but it is disappointing. Uh, it has been a disappointing period for sure. Um, you know, when, when economists talk about productivity, we talk about you know technology being a, a, a real um, you know driver. Education, these long term strategies that that really tackle your productivity. There's no there's no quick fix. Um, you know, we, we have these migration booms as well, which which make our numbers look look worse. Um, but I think you know the longer term is it really is that technology and and, and education um, you know strategy. Like you know, what what are we doing to to make our economy harder, faster, you know, more resilient? Um, and unfortunately, we we we're not doing enough. Um, and it goes back to that infrastructure. Uh, question right we we have let ourselves down by under investing in infrastructure over the last 30 years uh, so it's not one government versus another both of them have under invested for a very long time we haven't actually maintained our uh, our infrastructure to where to where it should be and we definitely haven't you know thought about future uh, proofing and 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 you know really igniting this economy for the next for the next generation. So for me, the best thing the government can do is tackle these infrastructure profit uh, projects. Um, you know this infrastructure deficit that we have, you know, it really needs to be tackled now. Um, it's a bit more difficult today because interest rates are so hard, so high. But you know we've been banging the drum on this for a very long time. Uh, and we haven't seen a, a meaningful shift of the of the needle, uh, and I, I'm kind of hoping that the the next government will will you know look at ways to to really boost the the infrastructure spending. To, to give you an idea, Treasury wrote an, a, a note quite a while ago. Um, you know, for every dollar that we would spend on infrastructure, we could get two two point seven uh, going through going through the economy, the, the multiplier is that high. You think, oh, that's great, right? It's actually an embarrassment. It just shows that we've underinvested for so long that we get such a big return on whatever spending we, we do. So we're behind the eight ball. I, I think we really need to, to focus on, if we want to get productivity better, 
the fact that it takes me 15 minutes to get out of my driveway and then 40 minutes to drive 10 k's you know that's that's just not good enough really Maybe a few more sinkholes will. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, yeah. yeah. I live next to one, so and, and Mark drives by one every every morning, and um, so it's a fresh reminder of exactly uh, <laughs> what can go wrong, and doesn't help the traffic when two of the lanes are gone. So, yeah. in in terms of yeah, unfortunately, as soon as you start talking about government spending for infrastructure, the the discussion seems to rapidly change to debt levels, which to me seems like a red herring. Uh, and what's your mm. view of sort of government debt levels and for New Zealand? Good, bad, I agree. different? I agree. Red, red herring. So, um, you know, the, the sovereign, the, 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 the government, uh, has very low levels of debt, very low levels uh, by international comparisons, 20% of net debt, which is tiny. Australia's got 45, uh, US is like 110 or something like that. UK is at a similar sort of level. Mo most European countries are around that sort of 80 to, to 100 plus uh, level. And then you've got, um, you know, our, our favorite debt country, uh, Japan, it's got 260% uh, debt to GDP, which is, you know, obviously off the, off the charts. Um, we could double our debt, you know, and I don't think, uh, it, it would have a material impact on, on, on us. Um, but you can also, you know, set up little funds and say, this is an infrastructure fund. It's going to go out and get its own debt. And we're going to put a toll on, on that road that we're about to build, or we're going to do something else. Uh, and it could be backed by the government. So it's got that strong credit rating, but goes out and issues its own debt. Um, and it's not caught up in election, election cycles. So th th there are so many ways that we could, you know, fund uh, the infrastructure that we need. Uh, that's not the problem. It's, it's the political will. Um, you know, you can come up with great ideas like, you know, Kiwi build, we want to build 100,000 homes. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that is the shortage that we calculated in 2018. Uh, we, our modelling suggests 100,000 shortage in, in home homes. How many did they end up building? A, thousand you know, a, hand, a handful. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think it was like, yeah, 1,000, 1,500, right? So unfortunately, you know, the government is then that much more nervous to do things like this. That inability to actually deliver um, is, is the sad part. It, it really is because the next, next government is going to go, well, geez, I, I don't want to make that mistake. Yeah, but we kind of we kind of need those ideas. Kiwiville was a good idea. Execution, unfortunately, not there. In Australia, you see, you know, your transurbans and these big infrastructure businesses that run toll roads and other assets on behalf of the government. It seems to work well. Um, yeah, those private partnerships work. You know, you get the businesses that know how to do it. Um, you get them in to, to to do it, and you and you you know, provide as much support from a government level as you as you can. Um, what I didn't mention, you know, government doesn't have much debt. Councils are loaded up to their eyeballs. So this is a real issue in, in New Zealand. We, we need to use that government balance sheet, that strength of that to, to, to help fund uh, all these projects. Councils, they can't do it. They don't, they don't have the money. Yeah, it's a, <clears throat> people who know me know it's a bit of a pet uh, subject that, uh, Something like Auckland Council, yeah, that's five times levered to, uh, for want of a better word, EBITDA. Um, yeah, anywhere else in the world, if that was a corporate, that would be a high yield junk credit. But yeah, gets a gets a a, a double A rating because of other issues. Yeah. So um, with that headroom that the government has, hopefully, or do you see them coming through and 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 um, you know, launching a, a push on, on infrastructure and the way that, you know, it's hard to, um, uh, it's hard to um, cut through when they're doing a lot of, um, you know, lolly scrambles in the lead up to the election about what's going to be done. But, it, you know, where do you see that going? Are we going to have, and, and then that'll obviously push, create another inflationary pulse through the system if we start mm -hmm. doing a lot of new roll, roads and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, I would like to see that, but I, I don't think we will. Um, I, I, I think we'll see a, you know, an increase in, in infrastructure spending, which would be 
you know good but we're not going to see this this big uh you know leap and, and and you know trying to do everything that we need to do at once and that would be inflationary but you know i i do think it's needed i, I don't think i think both governments have subscribed to this fiscal responsibility which is you know in their minds keeping you know debt levels well below 30 percent um and and you know that's a a, a, a self-imposed handbrake uh, right there so um yeah we'll get a bit more debt coming through just because the economic numbers are going to be worse than what treasury is is forecast uh, treasury is very optimistic in their forecast uh, at the moment so they'll be surprised on the on the downside and then we'll, we'll end up issuing a bit more debt but I, I don't think we're going to get these sorts of you know big increases in, in spending on infrastructure which is what we need but I don't think we'll get it and, and just coming back to your pri public private partnership yeah you know, we've got to, to give them a government credit the fiber rollout is the perfect example of that with chorus and the local fiber companies we do have some of the yeah. best internet in the world now thanks to that process yeah exactly there are there are uh you know blueprints out there aren't there yeah oh well if the government isn't going to be doing all of that then it sort of plays into kiwi bank's expectations for the interest rate path from here and i was looking at a chart that you guys sent out and you you are more dovish than some and um take us through where do you think interest rates are going over the next couple of years and, and probably so, as a segue as we talked talk before about how do you actually build that chart you know you always sort of see that at economists have this nice curve and just in, in lay terms how you go about sort of stepping that out yeah um so our our forecast um we think that the that the cash rate has peaked at, at five and a half percent i think the the last move that they made in may um it it, that's that's it uh, i think it stays at, at five and a half um we are optimistic on the inflation outlook we are um you know a little more dovish as you say than, than a number of economists uh, out there um i do hope i do think we'll be right on direction and and that the next move for interest rates will be lower picking the timing of that is very hard and and probably irrelevant to, to be fair like we're saying um you know the first rate cut you know is hopefully going to come through in may how did we come up with that well it's basically you know looking at our forecast and saying well if they the last move was in may this year let's give them 12 months basically uh, on average it takes you know nine to nine to ten months for the reserve bank to finish hiking and then start cutting again there's no no real science in that but uh that that's kind of how we feel things will will, will turn out um how do we come up with that with that curve well it's basically just that you know when are, when are they going to start cutting roughly um you know what's the direction so the direction's lower uh how fast are they going to cut and we've got quite a, a slow unusually slow rate cutting cycle uh from next year because we think that that push to two to three percent is going to be a little a little sticky and a little a little difficult um but basically we 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 come up with our forecast on the economy and we forecast many things but ultimately it feeds into a model um that looks at what activity is going to do over over the next little while and activity started contracting late last year we're expecting you know economic activity to to fall uh, over the next couple of quarters and then to be quite weak uh next year that is by rbnz design that's exactly what they they want to see that's exactly what their uh, positioning interest rates um, to do and then that feeds into you know our unemployment forecast that feeds into our cpi inflation uh, forecast and you know we see uh, inflation hitting four percent at the end of this year and then and then getting uh, below three percent next year um, if we're going to be wrong it's we're going to be wrong on on maybe the international uh, inflation um, but potentially, you know, some of the domestic inflation could prove to be stickier than than we're we're hoping. So, there are a lot of things that we forecast. We are economists. We love that stuff. Love playing with data. Love trying to predict the future, uh, and then putting all that together, we come up with an interest rate track 
now, which is based on what we think the Reserve Bank's going to do. In, in terms of thinking about those probabilities, uh, the one thing you haven't mentioned there is the risk that actually interest rates come down much faster than you expect. You know, if you look back through history, generally, you know, the move down in interest in, in short term interest rates, OCR, Fed funds, etc., can tend to be quite sharp and, and swift when it does happen. Do you think there's you know much chance of that? I do. I do. Um, most of I guess the the um, the risk that people come to us is that hey, you're calling for rate cuts. What if what if we see more rate hikes or on hold for longer? Um, we don't often get asked about that downside risk. Uh, and I think that downside risk, I would put it 20, 25% chance, right? I, I think it's material. Um, and as you say, we sort of, we, when it comes to interest rates, we, we sort of go up the stairs and then we drop uh, in the, in the uh, elevator shaft, right? So um, our forecast decline is very, very slow and unusual. Um, so, you know, there is a big risk that once they start cutting, they could cut faster than, than we're forecasting. Absolutely. Um, we're just kind of caught between um, what, what is probably a likely rate cutting path and also that kind of higher for longer bit. Those sudden rate cuts tend to happen after something breaks. Yep. So after the GFC, for example, when you look at the chart there for I guess, um, interest rates, it's the grinds upwards up the stairs as you say something breaks lemons or what have you and then suddenly it's um down we go so yeah. Yeah, by um, definition you never know what that mm. is but are there any areas of the the local economy that sort of give you concern in that that sense so uh well in pockets of of sort of unexpected stress i suppose from what we've seen so far we've we've had a lot of phone calls from from customers, you know, starting in sort of November last year. Hey, geez, my, my interest rate's gone from two and a half to five and a half. Oh, now it's gone to, to seven, seven and a half. Um, we fielded a lot of, a lot of, um, you know, calls as, as you would imagine, right? People, people make decisions on the price that they get and they made decisions at two and a half, three percent interest rates, you know, a couple of years ago. They're rolling off now. Um, we haven't seen a lift in defaults or a big lift in defaults because we haven't seen a big lift in unemployment. Uh, there is a risk there that things could could turn, uh, you know, uglier than than we're forecasting. And if you want to stress test a bank, you use an unemployment rate. So when we when we're stress tested by the Reserve Bank, they give us a whole bunch of variables, but basically the unemployment rate is the big one. And if you think the unemployment rate's going from three, six to five and a half, that's not a big deal. If it goes from, you know, five and a half to seven, you start seeing this exponential type lift in, in and if it goes to, to sort of eight, nine, 10, 11%, like we got in the early nineties, then you see a lot, a, a lot more defaults coming through. And, and that's, that is the downside, you know, risk. If we, if we see, you know, a big lift in unemployment, we're going to get a big lift uh, in defaults. Um, we're already, I think, seeing signs of stress uh, under people just having to pay a lot more on, on interest alongside the cost of living crisis and everything else that households are going through. Um, you know, I, I think the risk there is, is kind of, as you say, um, you know, the, these, these interest uh, expense uh, bills are, are, are really uh, mounting for households at the moment. And it would seem that that's sort of been a, <clears throat> a two-step process. As you say, they've gone from two and a half to four and a half, and now people are rolling from four and a half to seven and a half. Is that, you know, it seems to be that what's happening in the RBNZ data, is that, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Um, so the amount of, the, the, the interest bill that, that customers are facing, you know, has, has doubled and, and in some cases, you know, will, will nearly triple depending on, on you know, what, what, uh, what interest rate you got uh, a few years ago. Um, right now, uh, we, we had quite a, a, a big um, two year campaign two years ago. Uh, so I think a number of banks had the similar sort of campaign about two years ago. 
they're rolling off now um literally now over over spring and summer uh and that is actually quite a little lump uh on our on our balance sheet so half of their balance sheet has rolled off as you as you pointed to and we already saw a contraction in activity on the back of that the second half of our mortgage book is rolling off uh kind of as we speak about 30 percent um to year end and then another sort of 10 or so uh, percent after that so the impact has been felt you know half of it has been felt the other half is is you know uh in in process okay so let, um with your base case you see uh, interest rates coming down over the um the, in 2024 in the second half i think it was um starting yep. off in q3 perhaps late q3 um and then you see unemployment going up to 5.5 percent which is still in the um it's an okay place to be um as, as, a, as a country what what does it mean for asset prices if it plays out as in, in your version of um, the crystal ball gazing? So I think right now um, it, it's quite interesting for financial markets. You know, you've got this, uh, you know, we've got some good news coming through. Oh, but that's bad news because they're going to, they're going to hike more or, or, right. or hold for, for longer. And then you get some bad news coming through and, oh, does that mean that, the, you know, we've got the, the, the peak in interest rates and they're about to fall. So it's, it's, we're at that point. And you mentioned about something breaking. You know, a lot of people talk about the Fed always hiking until something breaks. Um, we thought something broke earlier in the year when the, uh, the SVB Bank and, and, and a few others uh, went went uh, went belly up. Uh, now that the the you know interest rates in the US, you know that ten year rates get into five percent, people are thinking that's gonna that's gonna cause you know significant pain and and something might might break um so i think it'll be interesting to see how how uh, financial markets work their way through but for me i'm a i'm an interest rate strategist uh, by heart so i really i i do focus on the rates markets and and i, I think the next big move for rates is actually going to be what we call a bull steepening where you know short end rates that they, they they push lower quite quickly as central banks turn around and say you know we're pivoting now we think we've done enough to to beat inflation next moves a rate cut when that is when they say that we're, we're going to get a big move in, in rates markets globally and i think that's the the move for next year it'll be the rates market that leads uh you will get hopefully quite a quite a decent move in in rate space and then equity markets will sort of take a a breather and go oh our, our discount factors are are, uh, are a little lower um you know this is this is a bit more pro growth uh from central banks uh and we'll see equities you know if the interest rates move we'll see equity markets really move uh and then to other assets you know kiwi's favorite asset uh i think there's a few things working but that shift in interest rate expectations will be the big driver for the housing market. Uh, once investors become confident that interest rates are declining, I think we'll see a bit of a bit of a bounce there. Uh, and then we've talked about migration. We, we do have the supply dem demand uh, shortfall in, in housing. So we've just added another, you know, 100 plus uh, thousand people, but we haven't added the 40, 50,000 homes that we need for them. So yeah uh that those you know property will 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 pick up as well commercial property uh might be slightly different in in different areas but you know broadly speaking interest rates heading south will help that market as well new zealand was quite early to lift interest rates going into it um and so you know one one perspective is we move faster than many other countries and that might play out again here if, if you know your case sort of that you you know um, your models play out in the way they do are there other countries outside of new zealand where you're seeing um it, it looking like they're coming towards the end of the tightening cycle i think most countries are coming to the end of, of the tightening cycle we saw the ecb uh, european uh, central bank pause last week that's the first time uh, they've paused since they started hiking last year. Uh, Bank of England, you know, uh, 
Um, probably next move is going to be a rate rate cut. Uh, the Fed very difficult. Maybe maybe we get another hike out of them. Uh, maybe another two, but you know probably peaking this year. Next move, you know, down whether it's late next year or in 2025. I think that discussion will be pulled forward. And then you look at the RBA. Uh, RBA were a lot slower than the RBNZ, about six months uh, slower, and they've only got their cash rate to 410. Uh, so I think we'll, we may see another rate rise from them as early as next week. Um, and, uh, you know, but that that will be probably about their last as, as well. So I think most central banks uh, will be looking to, to call the top uh, and then waiting to see what inflation does. Uh, and if inflation eases the way we hope it will, uh, then, you know, most central banks will be on a, on a cutting path. So we're quite synchronized in our... Um, and our movements, you know, central banks, uh, Reserve Bank in New Zealand, one of the first to hike. So we think they may be in a position to be one of the first to to, to go the other way. Uh, in fact, that's what we're we're calling. And and in terms of that thought process, how much is domestic versus that external impact? You know, how much time do you spend as an economist thinking about well, what's happening in Australia, what's happening in China, what's happening in the US, and what does that mean for us? I spend a lot of time, actually. I think if you're covering New Zealand, you've actually got to start offshore. We're a tiny, tiny, like Australia, tiny little uh, open uh, country with a, with a large export uh, sector. So, you know, if you look at our history, most shocks that we've gone through have started overseas. Uh, and, you know, we get these big terms of trade uh, shocks where our export prices move quite dramatically relative to our, our import prices and that can put big, big um, pressure on our economy. So we start offshore. Um, if we're to be you know, clinical about it, we've got a CPI basket where a, a little less than 50% uh, of our basket is international prices. So what's happening overseas and the other, the other a uh, little bit over half, uh, half is, is domestically generated. So that tradables part was what blew up. Uh, we saw prices increase and that came through. We're now seeing international prices uh, coming off and I think we'll actually see them decline uh, next year. So it'd be a bit of a, a source of deflation. And then, and then we're really focused on what the domestic uh, inflation outlook is, is like. So yeah, we put a big weight on, on what's happening in the global economy. Um, and you can see it, you know, it comes through in our dairy prices, how, how important that is. Some people have been arguing um, quite forcefully that China will export deflation again and uh, assume you'd start seeing that, um, or one would start seeing that in the emerging economies around China first, where they are, you know, larger portion of their economies are trading, you know, uh, are, are its trading partners. So, um, but well, at least I haven't seen anything to support that yet, but maybe, maybe you have. Um, uh, look, I, I think over a longer term, China's just not going to be the source of, of you know, disinflation or deflation that, that it used to be. It's, it's just not. Um, China's got its own problems. Uh, their, their, their population has peaked uh, and it's, it's an aging population. Uh, it's going to be one that, that's, you know, quite difficult to to um, get growing at the, at the rates that we're used to out of, out of China. Um, I think the focus will and should uh, shift to countries like India uh, and, and other countries in Asia. We need to diversify our, our exports. Um, you know, we've got a fantastic trading partner in China and they're our largest trading partner, but we need to look uh, elsewhere to, to get the growth that we need, uh, I think, over the, over the next decade. And I think India is going to sort of move higher and higher and higher uh, as, a, as a percentage of, of, of our total exports, um, you know, get going going forward. So China is a big story, but I think the next story is is not China. It's it's the broader Asia group, and then eventually we'll we'll look to maybe a few countries in Africa. But you know, Asia's still got heaps of growth. Uh, India's population doesn't peak until 2070, for example. It's very young. Uh, there's a lot of growth, a lot of potential out of India relative to China. 
going to say that's that's probably a segue into that uh, um, question economists always hate. The one asset class we haven't talked about is Kiwi, the New Zealand dollar. Um, thoughts on that? Ah, oh, see, this is me. I, I, I'm more of a financial markets uh, yeah. person. I, I love talking Kiwi. How long have we got here? Let's. Uh, <laughs> now, from my from my point of view, the Kiwi um, there's there's few main drivers of the Kiwi over time that the terms of trade that I mentioned before, particularly our export prices, what's what's happening there, um, you know, defines the Kiwi a bit. Uh, we call the Australian dollar and the New Zealand dollar and the Canadian dollar, uh, we call them uh, commodity country, uh, currencies, right? And, and it's because we, we export uh, big commodities. So what's happening with our export prices? Well, we, we've seen, you know, dairy come off, has bounced back a little bit, but it, you know, it's come off. A lot of our export prices have, have really, uh, you know, weakened. Uh, so that's put a bit of downward pressure on Kiwi. And then the next thing we think about is interest rate differentials. So what what interest rate are investors getting in New Zealand relative to the United States? And you know, we normally offer a higher interest rate because we've got a little bit more growth and a and a weaker uh, perceived credit rating. So you know that that that's actually narrowed quite a bit. And to take on the risk of the Kiwi currency, which is highly volatile, it's the most volatile uh, of the largest traded uh, currencies. You know, you need a bit more. To be fair, you need a bit more. Um, you know, you're getting similar interest rates in the US than you are in New Zealand, um, and you're not being compensated for that risk, as far as I'm concerned. So my forecast for the Kiwi is to drop to 55 cents. Uh, it's been our forecast since since last year. Uh, we're sort of sticking to it. We think it's slowly on that on that path, um, and it'll it'll sort of languish a, a, a around those sorts of levels for for a while into into next year. It is what we need from our exporters' point of view. You know, Fonterra would love a, a week at Kiwi because they receive dollars, um, but in terms of that inflation fight, it, it's not. It's not going to help. To flip that around, does that suggest you're still relatively positive uh, the US dollar? Because obviously Kiwi is, yeah, there's 99%, or oh, no, it's probably too aggressive, 90% driven by where the US dollar goes. Yeah, yeah. So I think that the Fed, um, you know, we may have another rate rise or two out of them by, by year end. Uh, we are seeing, you know, reasonable uh, turns in in. The, uh, in the US data, labor market still very strong. So that relative story of the US versus us versus the rest of the world, uh, I think points to a bit of dollar strength, uh, as you say. Uh, so that should be Kiwi uh, weakness. Um, and, and you know that's that's the same story if you're looking at the at the Aussie dollar or, or, or others. So yeah, bit a bit a bit more uh, dollar strength, um, and, and that that'll hopefully push the Kiwi. A little lower, which is good for the export sector. All right, um, coming into Christmas soon, aren't we? And um, what do you think our listeners uh, should focus on in terms of, you know, key data points? What are the big, sort of one or two data points that you think um, everyone should um, be looking at? Okay, so thinking of, thinking of it as if you're the Reserve Bank, really. Um, you look at what we call a Phillips curve. You look at what unemployment rates or underutilization rates of the labour market is doing, and then in, and then inflation. Um, and those are the key key data points. So out this Wednesday, um, we we've got the the employment report. Um, we are expecting to see the, the the unemployment rate lift. If we see that sort of lift a little further um, over coming quarters, then the Reserve Bank We'll, we'll take that as a good thing. Um, it's very hard for the Reserve Bank to come out and say we want to see, you know, people losing their jobs. They, they simply won't say that, but it's kind of what they need to see. They need to see that loosening up in the labour market to point to uh, a, a reduction in wage pressure, and that brings us to the the uh, the, the inflation numbers. So any any data uh, on prices. Uh, I think we're going to see some very heavy discounting to run down inventories into Christmas. So I think that there'll be a disinflationary force coming through 
uh, and hopefully, you know, the next readings on on inflation are, are, are much lower than where they were uh, a couple of weeks ago. So I think those are the two key, really. You, you look at your, your labour market, everything washes out on the labour market and, and the inflation uh, outlook as well. Fantastic, Jared. Thank you very much for your time. It's been a really interesting conversation and um, it's great to get a bit more detail around your forecast for interest rates and, um, and get in the direction of the employment market, among all the other things we've talked about. And uh, hopefully we'll have you back on the call, uh, not in 15 months, but maybe a bit sooner. So, um, yeah, and probably a little, a little bit less will have transpired in, <laughs> as it has over the last for us. Yes, thank you for uh, inviting me on. Awesome. Have a good week. Cheers. Cheers. This has been The Monday Call, brought to you by NZ Funds. New Zealand Funds Management Limited is the issuer of the NZ Funds KiwiSaver Scheme, the NZ Funds Managed Superannuation Service, the NZ Funds Advised Portfolio Service, the NZ Funds Wealth Builder, and NZ Funds Income Generator. A product disclosure statement for each is available at nzfunds.co.nz. Past performance is not necessarily an indicator of future returns. 